Uh, uh, well, good morning, everyone. I wanted to just join uh, Dr. Morrison and Nurse Dowling on the briefing uh, this morning, uh, uh, mainly because uh, next week marks the eight-month mark since the pandemic began. Uh, this morning, uh, Provincial Cabinet for the eighth consecutive month uh, extended the state of public health emergency in our province for another 30 days, and we will expect that will continue for the uh, foreseeable future. Uh, back in mid-March, when we faced uh, first faced with this pandemic uh, and it hit our shores, uh, none of us could predict uh, where we would be in at this time. Uh, but uh, we're in a very favorable position in this province because of the guidance of Dr. Morrison, of uh, Nurse Dowling and their teams, and because Islanders are committed to following the public health guidance uh, and are committed to doing their part for the health and well-being of fellow Islanders. Uh, I'm here this morning to ask all Islanders to continue that hard work, uh, to continue that commitment to following the public health protocols, and to continue taking the necessary precautions uh, that are keeping us safe here in Prince Edward Island. If you look across our country and around the world, the second wave is in full force. Uh, cases are rising, jurisdictions are tightening uh, restrictions, and lockdowns are also being reinstated. Uh, this is concerning for us here in Prince Edward Island because the simple things that we are enjoying right now, like taking our children to school, uh, taking our children to hockey or ringette practice, meeting our friends for supper at a restaurant, or attending a concert to support local artists, all could be very quickly and easily ripped from us if we aren't vigilant. Uh, we know and are, con are very conscious of the toll that this pandemic is having on all islanders. Uh, it is normal that we are feeling and getting antsy, uh, in particular those islanders who are eager to see family outside of the Atlantic bubble. And we also know that Christmas is just around the corner and that is the time when we usually welcome our family members home to reconnect and create memories with our loved ones or that many islanders use that time to visit friends and family outside of the Atlantic bubble. And this year we know that will be different. Uh, while we are still able to welcome friends and family home, uh, we will need to do so this year with a 14-day isolation. Uh, if you choose to visit outside of Atlantic Canada, uh, you're able to do so in this country as long as you, when you come home, uh, you know that you will be required to self-isolate for 14 days when you return. Uh, I know and, and we know that uh, this isn't ideal, uh, but sadly it is needed. Uh, we cannot risk going backwards. Uh, we are able to move about Prince Edward Island and Atlantic Canada much more freely and safely than any other jurisdiction in the country, perhaps for the whole world uh, for that matter. And we are fortunate uh, to do this because we have worked hard, because we have followed the health protocols, and because we have come together as a community and have determined that it's important to look out for each other. Uh, along the way, uh, we know and we have known that COVID fatigue is real. Uh, the three people on this desk right now feel as much as anybody else in Prince Edward Island, but we must remind ourselves that the health and safety of Islanders has and always must be the first priority for us. And while we do that, uh, we need Islanders to know that we are working and planning for the days ahead when we can begin to look at reopening our Atlantic borders to the rest of the country. Uh, we will do that by following the best and most up-to-date research and data. We will do it methodically, much like we did when we undertook the first steps to reopen PEI after the first wave a number of months ago. I do promise you we will get there, and we will get there only when we feel it is safe to do so. But to do that, we need to keep working together. We have been rewarded for the approach and the discipline we have shown in this province by having a province that is more open than others. And to continue to be rewarded, we need to continue to be vigilant. Although we are in a very good place right now in this province, our level of concern remains very high. The second wave, as I said, is upon us. Uh, and other jurisdictions are seeing their caseloads rise rapidly. And that is a concern to us as it was back in March uh, with our ability as a small jurisdiction to be able to withstand an outbreak here in this province safely. 
So it is important for us to ensure uh, our ability to move forward, to reopen, and to enjoy what we have been enjoying to date, uh, that we respect the health protocols. We work with Dr. Morrison and the public health staff so PEI can do its very best to mitigate the second wave as it makes its way across the country and the world. As Dr. Morrison has been consistently saying, uh, it, we need to slow burn our way through this over the next few months. And when we do that, uh, we can begin to look at what comes next, and we will be in a much better situation uh, to make our return by opening up uh, to the rest of Canada when it's safe to do so. So with that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Morris. Thank you, Premier. Today, I'll provide a brief update, including comments on COVID-19 in Prince Edward Island, Canada, and internationally. Also, Remembrance Day and community arenas. There are no new cases of COVID-19 to report in PEI today, and I am pleased to say there are no active cases in the province. All of the 64 cases we've had in PEI since the onset of the pandemic have recovered. In light of the resurgence of COVID-19 in Canada and around the world, our situation in PEI is unique at this time. I know we are all thankful that our case count remains low and we have not yet experienced the second wave of COVID-19. The situation in Canada continues to escalate with almost 21,000 new cases in the past week, a 17% increase from the previous week. This represents an average of a, over 3,000 new cases a day. So to put it in context, in July we were seeing about 300 new cases per day in Canada and now uh, 3,000 new cases a day. All prov provinces west of Atlantic Canada are struggling to contain COVID-19. Manitoba had a 97% increase, increase in new cases this past week. Alberta had a 37% increase in cases. British Columbia, 34%, and Saskatchewan, 31%. New Brunswick reported 17 new cases in the past week and currently has 33 active cases. Nova Scotia has 15 active cases. During the summer months, most cases occurred in the under 40 age group. However, that is changing with notable increases now occurring in individuals over the age of 80. We know this virus has a disproportionate impact on seniors and others who live in long-term care, and this virus knows no boundaries. It's not surprising that hospitalizations and ICU admissions are increasing across Canada with both increasing by about 11% during the past week. As daily case counts continue to rise in most provinces, we can expect to see more strain on health systems across Canada in the coming weeks and months. When we look at what is happening with COVID-19 around the world, it is even more alarming. And it is a stark reminder that it is a global situation and we are in a worldwide pandemic. The World Health Organization reports now 46,400,000 cases and 1.2 million deaths worldwide. Many countries are experiencing the impact of the second wave of COVID-19. France has instituted tougher restrictions on businesses and social interactions to protect their health system from the pressure of too many cases at once. Germany has instituted a partial wave breaker lockdown, including the closure of all bars, gyms, cinemas, and restaurants for the next month to decrease the rapid rise in cases. England announced a four week lockdown involving closing of pubs, restaurants, gyms, and places of worship. Spain has extended the state of emergency in that country for at least the next six months until March 2021 to help curb the second wave of COVID-19. It was predicted that the second wave of COVID-19 could be worse than the first wave in terms of both the numbers and the impact, and that is proving to be true. Canada could experience the same situation as Europe over the next one to two months. As a country, we have to be prepared to deal with an increased number of cases, and we may need to institute public health measures to limit transmission while protecting the healthcare system from being overwhelmed. As a province and as an island, we have benefited from controlling our borders with pre-approval travel and screening individuals as they enter Prince Edward Island. Early on in the pandemic, 
We have emphasized isolation and quarantine um, as we instituted a process of operation isolation where everyone who needs to self-isolate receives a daily check-in and screening call for the 14 days. These measures, border control, self-isolation, along with other public health measures that have been respected by Islanders, have been instrumental in keeping the numbers of COVID-19 low and containing the spread of this virus and PEI. It's also allowed us a time to make sure that we are as prepared as possible for a surge in cases. Right now, PEI has the lowest per capita incidence of COVID-19 of any province in Canada. And while we are in an enviable position today, we must not let our guard down. As has been stated previously, my recommendation will be to maintain pre-travel approval, border measures, screening and operation isolation, along with other public health measures uh, around guidance and inspections as we monitor the ongoing Canadian and global situation. Collectively, we must continue to stick to the basics, wash our hands frequently, keep our, our circle of contact small, maintain physical distancing, wear a mask in public indoor spaces, and stay home if we are not feeling well. We are all in this together. Our collective actions have kept us safe to this point, and our collective actions will keep us safe going forward. This Remembrance Day is a special one, marking the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. We can thank our veterans for the many freedoms we enjoy today. COVID-19 should not interfere with our desire and our duty to remember and thank our veterans. We will be doing it differently this year. Many traditional Remembrance Day events throughout the province have been cancelled or will be virtual while others are going ahead in a smaller, modified format. Approximately eight Remembrance Day operational plans have been approved by our office. These plans comply with the current guidance for multiple gatherings in the province. Participants at these events must maintain physical distancing and, if there is singing, the choir should maintain greater distancing or wear non-medical masks. I urge Islanders who attend any Remembrance Day receptions to please avoid mingling and maintain physical distancing from others who are outside their household. Please show your support and gratitude to our veterans by purchasing a poppy and paying our respects wherever you are on November the 11th. Sport and recreation staff from the Department of Health and Wellness have visited all 23 rinks in the province to support the development of operational plans. They are working with rink staff to identify solutions to support a safe return to play, keeping participants and spectators safe. Efforts are underway to, to su um, support having spectators in community rinks and to ensure they are observe physical distancing. Arena staff and volunteers have been working hard to safely accommodate multiple cohorts of people on the ice and in the stands by identifying new entry and exit points and marking off seating areas to encourage physical distancing. Please be patient with arena operators, staff and volunteers as they implement their operational plans. The safety of participants, coaches, volunteers and spectators is their primary concern. As I shared with you last week, I am concerned about Christmas and holiday travel as we all turn our sights uh, to the upcoming holidays. It's understandable that families want to celebrate together. And many Islanders, especially seniors, look forward to having family members come home for the holidays. At this point, given that we are just beginning to see the tremendous impact of the second wave of COVID-19 in other provinces and around the world, we will be maintaining the legal requirement for family members who receive pre-approval travel to PEI for the holidays to self-isolate for 14 days. However, we are continuing to evaluate the evidence and options to decrease the period of quarantine. As the Premier mentioned, we are all looking forward to a time when we will be able to travel with a reduced period of quarantine but not yet. For all Islanders, I ask that you plan for very small household gatherings over the holidays. This is not the year to host large Christmas gatherings with people outside your household. 
I was struck by a story that Dr. Bonnie Henry in BC relayed last week about a small birthday party that resulted in the death of an 80-year-old woman. The person contracted COVID-19 at the small gathering where there were less than 10 people present. Most of the people in attendance became infected with COVID-19 and tragically, this elderly person died. This story highlights how easily COVID-19 spreads and that small household gatherings are a significant source of transmission. And just because you know people in attendance, it does not mean you will not get COVID-19. This situation could easily happen in PEI. We cannot become complacent. We should not assume that any gathering with close contacts will be okay and there is no risk of contracting COVID-19. In closing, I want to thank the many people who are supporting the COVID-19 response in PEI. We have wonderful partnerships with other departments, organizations and groups that are committed to working with our office to keep Islanders safe. Thank you for all you do. We could not do this without your support and efforts. Thank you to Islanders who continue to be committed to the public health measures and are demonstrating how much they care about their health and the health of others. Our province could not do this without you. As we continue to work together to protect PEI from the devastating impacts of COVID-19, I'd like to repeat my earlier comment that we are all in this together. Our collective actions and efforts have limited the impact of COVID-19 and PEI, and our individual and collective actions will keep us safer going forward. As we are in this eighth month of, uh, of uh, this pandemic here in PEI and the response, Please be safe, care for each other, and please continue to be patient, and please continue to be kind. Thank you. Thank you. The health system or joint response team continues to be in an active monitoring and planning level. One of our key roles is ensuring patients continue to be seen in the most appropriate location by the most appropriate care provider. During COVID, that's meant helping direct people who have cold and flu-like illnesses who might otherwise have visited a doctor's office or emergency department to instead attend one of our cough and fever clinics. These clinics have appointments available to anyone with cold symptoms such as congestion, coughing, sore throat and fever. And if you have these symptoms and need to see a doctor or nurse practitioner, please call your regular family practitioner's office and they can refer you directly to the cough and fever clinics either in Summerside or Charlottetown. If you don't have a family doctor, you can call 811 to be referred directly to the clinic. For all other non-urgent or emergency issues, your family doctor or nurse practitioner offices are now open for both in-person and virtual visits and are seeing patients. Our COVID testing clinics are running smoothly and continue to be busy. We have a very dedicated group of staff and partners working with us at these clinics to provide this very important service. Yesterday, all together at our clinics, there were 376 people swabbed. Last week in Montague, we began offering services out of a new location, the Montague Legion, giving an indoor space for swabbing during the fall and winter months. Thank you to the local, local Legion for its partnership and cooperation in providing this space for this service. This week, the O'Leary testing site will operate from 1 to 4 p.m. on all three days, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And that's a change beginning tomorrow. It will be in the afternoon from 1 p.m. 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. We know that testing will continue to be important moving forward, and we will continue to adjust as we need to provide testing services to help contain and control any cases of the virus. I'm pleased to provide an update on further reinstatement of mental health services. And yesterday, Unit 9 at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital was reopened for inpatient mental health care on top of our inpatient unit at the Hillsborough Hospital and at Prince County Hospital. Over the past several weeks, there were approximately 14 patients on Unit 9 who were awaiting long-term care beds. In order to reopen Unit 9 to inpatient mental health, accommodations for these patients were necessary. All but eight of these patients have been transferred to other locations and plans are in place to transition the remaining patients to appropriate space in the near future. 
In the meantime, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital has separated a portion of the unit for these patients and we will be retaining eight spaces for these patients with dementia who require a secure location for their care. Renovations have been made to the unit to keep these two patient groups completely separate and visitors will notice separate entrance and exits for these care areas. Health PEI continues to do everything it can and work with our partners in private and public facilities to provide placements for the remaining patients with dementia in long-term care homes and we continue to be thankful and fortunate to be able to offer many of our regular health services. Thank you to all Islanders, as Dr. Morrison and the Premier have already mentioned, for your continued compliance and following the public health me measures. Our health system needs your support and continued support as we move through the second wave that we see across the country. Please continue to seek care with our system when you need it and bring and wear your mask. Thank you. So I guess we will now uh, invite some questions from our friends in the media. Brittany, CBC. Hi there. Uh, my first question is for Dr. Morrison. Um, I guess in light of uh, the second wave that's happening across the country, um, I'm interested to know uh, what the province is doing to prepare for the possible increase in travel uh, to and from the island around the holiday season, um, whether or not you're looking at things like uh, increased testing, places to isolate, uh, increased clinics, things like that. Hi, hi, Brittany. So we've been having uh, lots of discussion about the approaching holiday season um, and uh, certainly a reminder that those traveling uh, um, to Prince Edward Island need to have pre-approval travel if they're not island residents uh, to come to Prince Edward Island and uh, really the uh, and, and making sure those messages around isolation continue. The, uh, there's been, love, previously we've talked about some of the discussions around uh, over the holidays, students, international students and other students coming to Prince Edward Island and uh, making sure that we have facilities uh, for them to isolate if needed. Um, and international students, we had a designated facility for them before. We've had um, some questions about um, making sure that there's accommodations available for those who cannot self-isolate uh, with uh, their family for for any particular reason when uh, they come. So those are being looked at. And I think we're very conscious that uh, uh, we, we're going to be making sure that testing continues. It's such an important part of early identification and uh, th so that's going to be maintained uh, throughout uh, the holidays um, and uh, and if we have more people here knowing that whether you're an islander or a visitor um, getting tested if you have symptoms is really key so i think we're certainly having all those conversations wanting to make sure there's access um, and availability of the things that uh, continue to be important parts of our response here to COVID 19. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, my second question uh, is around uh, your discussion, or you mentioned decreased quarantine, and then that's something that uh, is being explored in other jurisdictions and, and that we're wa you're watching uh, here. Can you tell me a little bit about what that means and, and what that could look like? Well, as you mentioned, there's certainly some pilot projects in, in other provinces, um, and I, I think the whole country is looking at uh, uh, recognize looking at how you could reduce quarantine safely so for instance uh, if you were able to have three negative tests over a period of 10 days uh, the chances of it uh, converting to uh, from a negative test to a positive test between days 10 and 14 is very uh, much lower so that is a, a potential that is being looked at and uh, certainly if we could reduce that period of quarantine over time that would um, be w w important. Uh, we know that self-isolation and quarantine is n not easy and it's challenging. 
So, uh, but we, we are always trying to balance that, uh, the risk uh, of spread of illness um, and uh, wanting to keep the community safe. So we want to make sure that uh, we're in a good position to uh, do the testing uh, three times for everyone mm -hmm. who's in uh, uh, isolation, but also that uh, we don't uh, risk uh, uh, a spread of illness when we have done so well uh, to this point. Okay, thank you so much. Francois Radio Canada. Gabrielle Radio Canada. Louise, CBC. Hi there, and good afternoon uh, to all three of you today. Uh, Dr. Morrison, we're working on a, a Christmas party <laughs> story today, so we're looking for some uh, of your advice, uh, particularly for businesses with more than 20 staff hoping to hold a party. Um, you know, how do they make this work? Have you received any operational plans for groups hoping to hold large Christmas parties at this point, and do you in anticipate an influx of those types of operational plans? Hi, Louise. So I know we have received some uh, Christmas uh, party function uh, operational plans, and uh, I would anticipate more. We've talked about it before that uh, this uh, we would encourage businesses and organizations to maybe consider some alternatives to your normal cr Christmas uh, functions, uh, but uh, we are looking at uh, the ones that we do receive. Uh, and it's really making sure that they follow the multiple gathering guidance, um, that uh, the organizers appreciate that the same public health measures are going to be put in place in terms of how people should be seated, uh, distance between people, um, distance between tables, um, and to avoid the mingling that uh, we would normally be having uh, during these kind of Christmas functions. So um, I think uh, the measures aren't going to be different um, because it's a Christmas function versus another kind of function, and um, but we are looking at uh, some of those operational plans. Uh, last week, uh, Dr. Tam, uh, Canada's chief public health officer, said that uh, Canadians need to cut contacts by 25 percent to curb uh, second the second wave of COVID-19. Um, and and we, she was illustrating that using the modeling. Um, does that apply here to PEI? Would you like to see people still reduce their circles even more? I know that we have no cases right now, no active cases, but when the Chief Public Health Officer of Canada says something like that, how do you apply that to, to Prince Edward Island? Uh, Louise, a really good question. I mean, because we've talked about the fact that we are in a fairly unique position at this point in time. And when you do look at that, uh, the, the national modeling, if we continue without decreasing our contacts as a country, um, that uh, curve just extends and, and continues to go up. Uh, and But if we do reduce our contacts uh, as a country, it will uh, decrease. We uh, are in a but in Prince Edward Island, we are in a sort of our new normal phase, and we are continuing to um, really, as the Premier mentioned, take our children to different sports, uh, go to restaurants, and uh, participate in many of our activities. But I think we need to be very conscious of the fact that we should keep our gatherings small. I've talked about today, you know, even as we look ahead, our gatherings at Christmas, keep them small. Um, We've talked week after week about avoiding large gatherings and, and uh, um, big functions, where, especially where you cannot maintain physical distancing. So it is, uh, we're certainly conscious of that uh, guidance nationally, and we may need to be very uh, specific about that um, if we start to see a change in the cases here in Prince Edward Island, where um, we would limit um, our gathering size again. And um, right now, our personal gathering limit is 20, and, uh, and that is part of the order. Um, we think that um, that we're not planning to change that right now, but uh, if we had to reduce it in the future, we we would. So uh, it's just an ongoing reminder um, when we see what's going on 
across the country and Dr. Tam uh, looking at the modeling of what uh, lies ahead, that we should uh, be conscious of that here, recognizing that we are in a very uh, different situation at this time. Thank you very much. Rachel Collier, Eastern Graphic. Hi, um, today we were just looking for an update about uh, how many people have been fined so far for disregarding COVID-19 uh, related rules on the island. I don't know if you'd have those numbers with you today. I think they're sitting just outside the room, the exact numbers, but I think, uh, uh, I believe, uh, Rachel, I think it's uh, 54 uh, charges have been laid. We have um, a large number of people whose residences have been visited, um, another um, fairly significant number that have received warnings, and then uh, I believe it's 54, but we can confirm that uh, um, as I uh, as I leave here, and they have been primarily for failure to um, self isolate. Okay, and uh, I guess maybe since Premier King, since you're here today, um, would you know uh, when tenants living in public assisted living locations can expect their common rooms to open up? From what I understand, uh, some operational plans are in the works, but. People have been waiting for a while, so they're kind of uh, asking us, actually, uh, when when these common rooms might open. I don't know if you would have the information about that. Let Dr. Morrison handle that operational question. I think she'd be much more equipped and knowledgeable than me uh, on that. Um, well, Ra Rachel, we actually spoke, I spoke about this uh, in the briefing last week about common rooms, and uh, so we can uh, send you some of the guidance on that and that included information that went out to um, the departments um, responsible for a lot of the uh, seniors um, complexes and that common rooms certainly are able to be open uh, if they're able to um, you know have enhanced cleaning um, for instance, so we have uh, sent that information out, made sure our guidance was updated, and we also spoke about uh, card games at the same time because that some of those common rooms being used uh, for those uh, situations. So uh, we can uh, forward that uh, those statements from last week uh, to you as well. Okay, thanks a lot. Stu Neepy, The Guardian. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, main questions today for uh, Ms. Dowling. Uh, just on the, the Unit 9 reopening, uh, a couple of weeks back, Bob Nut Brown from uh, PEI Seniors Home had told a standing committee that uh, he'd written to the Minister of Health offering uh, 16 to 20 beds uh, for dementia patients. So I'm just wondering of the, I guess, approximately six patients who have been moved from Unit 9 to other uh, facilities, have, have they gone to uh, facilities within PEI Seniors Home? And what's preventing the, the full 14, I guess, from being moved to these, these private facilities? Hi, Stu. Um, thanks for the question. I know that some of the individuals who have been transferred from Unit 9 to long-term care homes have gone to specific dementia care unit beds within our system. I don't know specifically if they've gone to that organization's homes um, and whether or not those particular new homes that were offered up to one of the standing committees have received um, endorsement and licensure under the Community Care and Nursing Homes Board. So I'd have to have uh, someone follow up with you on those specifics as to whether those beds have been licensed and are now available to the system. I'm not aware of that information. Uh, certainly the individuals remaining on Unit 9, the 8, who are individuals with dementia, do require um, specialized units um, and placement with staff who are familiar with caring for individuals with dementia and also have the environment set up to to make sure that it is safe for those individuals. So there is a wait, um, unfortunately, on Prince Edward Island for long-term care home placement and specific those specialized dementia care units. Okay, thank you for that. And I, I guess as a bit of a follow, so 
I, I mean, there's been all this conversation about uh, the reopening of you and I for for a couple of weeks. Uh, can you tell me uh, with the six beds that are currently opening? It has has full programming kind of been restored, or is it sort of partial? Like, what's what's it look like from that that angle? Well, there. If we remember back to the beginning of the pandemic um, and how much the mental health and addictions team really shifted their service delivery to offer some of that acute mental health services through our psychiatric urgent care clinics. Obviously, some of the staff who were uh, supporting the care in our acute mental health units, like Unit 9, were redeployed and reassigned to offer that different level of service. And what we've seen from those psychiatric urgent care clinics is a very positive response from both the individuals receiving care and the health system care providers who've been involved. So we want to maintain those. Um, the specifics for what I'm aware of today for the inpatient care at Unit 9 is that there is the full inpatient acute psychiatric care available within those beds that have been opened on that unit. We want to continue. Okay, we want to continue to maintain those psychiatric urgent care uh, centers as well, uh, because they have been uh, very positive for the clients. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Um, I believe that's it. So uh, thank you very much uh, for the briefing today, and to our friends in the media, thank you as always, and uh, have a good day.